Hello Hope Church, I hope that uh, everyone is uh, staying home, staying safe and staying strong. It's good to be back, I believe I was here sharing with you uh, two years ago. And today I'm going to bring you a message entitled, Pressing the Reset Button for Marriage and Family. Now I'm not sure about you, but it seems that the whole world is going through a reset. Example, the economy. The economy has been going through a reset in the last few months. You know, jobs that were there before now, no more. Jobs that were never there before suddenly surface. You know, we're going to innovation, technology. And now the other thing that has gone through a reset is the environment. I'm not sure about you, but it seems that the grass are becoming greener, uh, the air is fresher, airplanes are not flying, the fishes are coming out in some of the rivers that we have never seen fishes before. So the environment has also been going through a reset. The government, many governments all over the world seem to be going through a reset as well, including Singapore. I mean, recently we had our elections and it seems that there's a new leadership leading a new generation of Singaporeans. And of course, the church has been going through a reset. The fact that I'm here and you are where you are in your own homes and the comfort of your homes, watching me sharing through your screen, the church has been pivoting as well. And I'm sure there are many opportunities that the church can take advantage of in this reset. But today, I'm going to touch on pressing the reset button for marriage and family. Because marriages, families, relationships are also going through a reset. Now, the choice is up to us whether we want to come out of this crisis stronger or we're going to come out weaker than before. But I believe that with God in our lives, with God in our marriage, with God in our families, we can come out stronger. So now, if you're ready, let's have this uh, sharing uh, on pressing the reset button for marriage and family. Now, in order to press the reset, I think we need to go back to the beginning where everything started because in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's where we, God created the earth and that's why the earth is now going through a reset. But God also created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Now, if I can break this down into the order of relationships, God created man in his image, so there's a God-man relationship, male and female, so there's a husband and wife relationship, be fruitful. So parents having children, so there are parents and children relationship. And from there, God said, fill the earth, subdue it. What it means is that there's a left leg and a right leg. You know, I always tell people, you know, if you want to go out and cheong, we want to go and rule the world, we're going to have dominion over the world, we want to build careers, we want to plant churches. That is like, going forward, you know, taking a leap forward. But what about our hind leg? The bigger the leap, we need to make sure that our hind leg is strong, which means our relationship at home, our relationship with our spouse, our relationship with God need to be strong in order we can fill the earth and subdue it. To press the reset button, we need to press the upstream, the midstream, as well as the downstream. So I'm going to start with the downstream, the parent-child relationship first. You know, towards the end of March, if you can see this newspaper article, uh, we are just about to start the circuit breaker. And of course, the government introduced sweeping new measures to check virus spread, which is basically a lot of restrictions. And one of the things that the, uh, the government announced was no more church services. Of course, all the Christians panic. And the government also announced no more tuition. <laughs> all the parents panic, but I think all the children were very happy. Now, I want to touch on this because... Uh, uh, academics, performance in school seems to be creating a lot of stress and conflict at home. Many children grew up trying to perform, trying to please their parents. And parents think that just because you are able to perform well in school, you will be able to do well in life. Now, trust me, I'm a father of two young adult children. That is not always the case. Let me touch on uh, Proverbs 22 verse 6. Train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, the problem with me is that many years ago, I thought this verse meant that train up my children in the way that I want them to go. Wow, I never become a doctor. I want my children to become a doctor. I never become a lawyer. I want my children to become a lawyer. I never learn how to play the piano. I want my children to learn the piano. Now, this verse doesn't mean that. This verse doesn't mean train up a child in the way that I want them to go. What this verse means is that train up the child in the way that God has designed them, God has created them, God has gifted them so that we can partner with God and steward this precious life so that they can go where God wants them to go. Now, I thank God that I learned this, this lesson early before it was too late. Now, look at this photo. You know where this was taken? My daughter's primary school, many years ago. It, you know what day it was? It was PSLE results day. 
Look at the faces. Do you think good results or not so good results? Well, we are smiling, which means the results are quite good. And of course, she went into a good school. In fact, integrated program. That means through train, can skip O level and go straight to A levels. But guess what? She did very well for her primary school, PSLE exams. But everything started to go downhill after that. In fact, I remember, you know, when she was struggling, you know, I would try to comfort her. I, I said, uh, uh, dear, you know, uh, uh, you may not be good in maths. You may not be good in uh, uh, biology. You may not go in chemistry. And then she said, Dad, I know what you're tr trying to tell me. I said, but, 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 you're good with children. You know, in the cell group, whenever we come together, all oh, the little kids will run to you. They, they, they adore you. You're good with children. And, and you have leadership because you are vice captain of your school floorball, right? Team, right? You have leadership and you have compassion. You told me, whenever your friends have problems, come to you for counselling. So you have all these gifts, you have all these talents, you have all these strengths. And then she felt better, right? And then suddenly she looked at me and said, Dad, but the school never give marks for all these things. <laughs> it is true, the school never give marks for all these things, but does it mean that it's not important? So of course, I encouraged her, I said, dear, in life, these are life skills, these are important. God has gifted you differently from other people. You don't have to compare. And of course, I thank God. You know, after her A-levels, I decided to maybe put her in a, in a, a, a childcare center for, for placement, for internship. Maybe she can discover that's, that's her, her, her career. And guess what? She came back after three, four weeks and said, dad, I love children, but too many children running around. Lah. <laughs> I thought you love children. And then, but then she said, I, somehow I'm drawn to that one child that's quiet, that, 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 that lonely child, that child that was bullied, that special needs child. Ah, I say maybe child psychology because kindergarten, childcare is one to many children. Psychology, one to one, one at a time. And of course, you, I got her a placement in, in, a, in, a, in a psychological services uh, center. She came back after two weeks. She said, Dad, but to be a psychologist, need to study six years. Too long, too long. Finally, we scoped, we helped her, and then she started to do speech therapy. And she got a degree from there. She graduated uh, two years ago and now working in the hospital, working with children. As parents, we need to help our children discover their gifts and talents. The school may give marks for some things, but we can give marks for other things. We cannot determine our child's future by the marks that they get in school. No, I love this uh, uh, cartoon. For a fair selection, Everybody has to take the same exam. Please climb that tree. Now, do you think it's a fair exam? <laughs> I don't think so. You know, our children are all gifted differently. They may all look the same, right? Uh, little, little uh, human beings running around. But trust me, every one of them is gifted differently. No, I love uh, the Albert, Albert Einstein, the genius himself, said this. Everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its life believing that it is stupid. Now, no one is stupid. No, Jack New has this movie, I'm not stupid. Indeed, it's true. Jack New is correct. No one is stupid. Everyone is gifted differently because God created us in His image. We are all precious in God's sight. You know, many years ago, as a young parents, you know, my wife and I, we always make sure we find time with our children. We don't have a lot of time. Both of us were working then. And, uh, but yet, each time we spend time with them, I, as a father, will try to discover what is their strength, what is their talent, what is their gift. You know, we do not emphasize on their weaknesses. We try to look at their strength. Uh, so, during the COVID-19, this period, you know, some of us may not be able to go overseas for vacation. Well, have staycation and use that time to discover the beauty that God has put into our children. Now, I have a special message for fathers because fathers, as the spiritual head of the household, you know, you have an important role to play. You know, fathers impact nations and generations. Yeah, fathers impact not just our children, but our children's children. And as a result, we also impact the nation, not just nation, but nations. Now, I'll give you a verse from the Bible, one of my favorites. Genesis chapter 18, verse 18. Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. No, God spoke, spoke to one man. This man his name was Abraham, but God told him that you will be now called Abraham. Not just a father, but a father of nations. He's meant to father nations. And God spoke to him, one man, and said, you will become a great and powerful nation and all nations on earth will be blessed through you. One man. You know, nation, blessing nations, sound like Singapore, right? Because Singapore is the end of Asia. We believe that we are the blessing to the nations. Now, if we are a nation that bless the nations, then what is the secret? You know, if God were to come to me, I was actually meditating on this verse when I first read it a few years ago. 
Wow, if God come to me and say, Jason, you'll be a blessing to your nation, and not just your nation, no, but the nations. You know what I'll be doing? I say, well, I better get a master's in, uh, in uh, business administration because, you know, got to create jobs for the nation. Maybe I, 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 I should set up the education ministry, you know, uh, because education is important. Oh, maybe we need a strong defense force. Wow, MINDEF is important. These are all important. But what is God's secret? You know, the secret to build strong nations is found in the next verse, Genesis 18, verse 19. Let me read it to you. God spoke to Abraham, one man, and said, I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. What did God promise Abraham? A nation that will be a blessing to the nations. And what is the secret to do that, to, to achieve that promise? It is for Abraham to disciple his children and his household after him. You know, fathers, you have a very important role to play now. The fact that we are not gathering as a church, you know, you are the one, you are the pastor, you are the priest, you are the prophet at home. You know, I know of one church. He, the, the pastor called me up and said, Jason, you know what I've decided because of the whole fathers movement, the Elijah 7000, I've decided not to even have online service. I said, what? You don't even have online service? So what are you going to do? How do you do church? He said, I decided to, to, to empower my fathers in the church that they will do church at home. So what he did is that he gathered the fathers over Zoom, you know, every one, two weeks, and uh, he will disciple the fathers and he told the fathers, now you do the discipling of your own family, of your wife and of your children. Of course, he did, did that for a few weeks. And I must say that the fathers have risen up as a result in discipling their own family. Now, no excuse, even though that uh, now we can't gather in big groups, now uh, the fathers that I know are now still gathering together via Zoom. In fact, the attendance has gone up because fathers are stressed. They don't know what to do. They don't know how to be the spiritual head of the family. So they're coming together to learn from each other. Now, the beautiful thing about such gatherings is that it's not in the big group. It is actually in the small group. When we do live, you know, when we break the fathers up into three people, four people, that is where in that 30 minutes, in that, in that 45 minutes, they share their struggles, they share their pain. At the same time, they share their joy, they share what they have tried and what, they, what works, and, and they begin to help each other to be better heads of the family. Now, I must tell you, no father is perfect, no mother is perfect, no marriage is perfect, no family is perfect. Uh, just in case, even as I talk about the importance of fathers, some of us feel the pain in our heart that, yeah, my father is not like that. My father was not a, uh, 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 yeah, he was, he, he, he was the head of the family, but he wasn't really modeling that. You know, I was mentoring one young man before, and I remember each time I met him, he would be complaining about his father. He would go on and on, and, uh, and it, it, up to a point, I didn't know what to say to him anymore. I would just listen to him. But one day I decided, God, you, you gave me the wisdom to help this young man uh, to move on. And then a question dropped into, into my head and I asked this young man, I said, do you know how your father was fathered by his father? Basically, I was asking him about his father's relationship with his grandfather. And he stopped complaining. He looked at me and said, yeah, my grandfather was never there for my father. My grandfather was also a bad father. And that was when the Lord gave me the words to speak to this young man. And I said, do you know, we cannot give what we have not received. You know, if I receive love, I can give love. But what if I receive pain? I receive hurt. I receive beating. I may have no choice but to pass some of this pain to the next generation. You know, some of our parents, they have never received the kind of love that we need. And they cannot give us that kind of love. But the beautiful thing that uh, for us, because we are Christians, we can go to the Father, we can go to God, we can go to the cross. You know, while we cannot give what we have not received, we can go to God and we can receive this love. Because the Bible says in 1 John 4, 19, we love because He first loved us. We are able to love because He first loved us and out of that overflow, we can love others. You know, recently I was preparing for the day of His power. Uh, I was just praying before the Lord and I saw a picture of champagne glasses at the wedding. You know, I, I drew it out, but I thought, you know, my drawing is so bad, I, I better, you know, find a nice photo to show you. This was what I saw. You know, when we receive love, the love overflow, 
we receive love from our Father, we receive love from God, it overflows and then we receive it and then we overflow and we pass on to others in our family, to our wife, to our, to, to our husband, to our father, to our children. But guess what? Those at the bottom, they are still waiting for love. So I encourage you, if you think that you do not have enough love, go to God Himself and let Him pour out that love to you so that out of that you can pour to your family. Now, let us go to the midstream. Earlier, I was talking about parent-child relationship, child-parent relationship. That's the downstream. Let us go midstream, the husband and wife relationship. You know, if we receive this love from our father, we can give this love to our wife. We, if we receive this love from our father, you know, for the wives, we can give this love to our husband. You know, during the COVID situation, especially in the March, February, China was the first to be hit. You know, initially they were expecting a baby boom because they think that everybody stay at home, you know, they can have make babies. But instead of a baby boom, it became a divorce explosion. In fact, divorce cases started to rise in China. And of course, subsequently, all over the world, there's family violence cases, family conflicts. You know, there are, suddenly all the problems that were swept under the carpet suddenly rose up, became obvious because of the COVID-19 situation. You know, focus on the family, in the month of July, we did a survey. We call it the Seasons of Marriage Survey, whereby there were almost 600 respondents. And it was found that the daily interactions with spouse, 37%, which is 4 out of 10 couples, they are not talking or doing things together. You know, we have more time together, but they are not taking advantage of the time. They are not talking. And then 6% is leading completely separate lives. It's like they are saying the same house, but they are strangers to each other. And in terms of conversations, 35% say conversations are lacking, meaning they are walking around in the house, they are doing their own thing. Maybe each person has a table, a laptop, but they are not talking. In fact, 7% say it's cold. Now, I'm not sure about you. If this is where you are, I encourage you, do not allow these little cracks to grow into bigger cracks. You know, if you have plants at home, you need to Water the plant, you need to every now and then take a look at the plant because if you neglect it, sooner or later, the leaves will dry it up, the plant's going to die. Similarly, a marriage relationship, we need to water it, we need to put fertilizer, we, we need to invest in that. You know, I drive a car. Similarly, for us, for those of us who own cars, when we drive, we cannot just keep driving it and don't send for maintenance. You know, even if it's a new car, it will say every 5,000 must go for a check, 10,000 kilometers must go for a check, you know, check the tires. And nowadays with modern technology, whenever I drive a car, you know, whenever something goes wrong, maybe the tire is a bit flat, think there's a red light here pointing that something is wrong with the tire. I need to check it, you know. If I keep driving, for sure, I cannot drive anymore. Some years ago, I wasn't so savvy. There were, technology wasn't so, so, so advanced. Uh, I forgot to fill up the water, the, the cooler in my car. And it overheated. I almost got stuck in the middle of the road. And after that, I never dare to, uh, to uh, ignore the maintenance. So I encourage husband and wife, do maintenance. You know, with, with uh, the recent uh, circuit breaker COVID, you know, my wife and I used to go out for walks, but because we have to stay at home, we couldn't. But guess what? We just switched on the computer and then we started to do walking at home following some, some uh, 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 exercise routine and it was wonderful uh, and just recently both of us decided you know let's go for a date we are married almost 30 years uh, it's been a long time because of busyness with children and we started to date again and we went to gardens by the bay just for half a day it was beautiful i mean staycation come on just invest in your own local economy right now another findings from the seasons of marriage survey we found that the love tank the love tank with our spouse 20% say constantly depleted, meaning I guess they give, they give, but it is not filled up by the other party. And 10% say it's al almost always empty. Basically, the other party is just taking, 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 never helping to fill up that empty love tank. And conflict-wise, 15% were uncomfortable talking about conflict, meaning we sweep things under the carpet. And 22% have harsh arguments or cold wars. Now, I'm not sure about you, do you think your temperature, wherever you are now, is just right? No, if it is too cold, if it is too hot, you will feel very uncomfortable. You know, at home, the husband and wife, the marriage sets the temperature for the whole family. Recently, a father reached out to me. He has a young daughter. 
he was having problem with the wife. In fact, he was thinking about divorce. And then I remember asking him, do you know that you and your wife set the temperature for the whole household? Is your children feeling that it is too cold or too hot? The, your children is feeling that the temperature is not right for them because children are very sensitive. And then he stopped talking, he looked at me and he said, just yesterday, the daughter went to him and said, Dad, I don't think God is real. I think there's no God. The dad was shocked because they are a Christian family. They go to church, they have family devotion, they pray at home. But the daughter looked at the dad and said, I don't think there's God. And of course, I asked the dad, did you ask her why she say that? Of course, the dad didn't, you know. And the next time, the dad met me again, the dad said, he went to ask the daughter why the daughter said she didn't believe God is real. And the answer the daughter gave was, if God is real, how come you and mommy cannot get along? You know, the dad repented before the Lord and the dad realized that how he is doing marriage with the wife is going to impact his children forever. You know, if we cannot find love at the right place, we will find it at the wrong places. You know, husband and wife are supposed to love each other, support each other, but if we cannot find love at the right place, we will find it at the wrong places. Focus on the Family has done a whole life survey in the last three, five years, and we discovered that one out of 20 Christian men, one out of 20, have sexual relationships outside their marriage. For women, it is one out of 50. Now, as of course, that is uh, sexual relationships, sexual encounters. But if people who are not going there, they may start with pornography. The survey found that three out of five men, Christian men, three out of five, that means 60%, are into pornography, whereas women is one out of five, 20%. I want to say something about the pornography. One is pornography is the new drug. It is addictive. You know, I used to work with drug addicts. I can tell you, drugs destroy lives. Because you think, you take a bit, you make me happy for a while, but it is not going to be enough. The next time you take, you have to be more and more. And after a while, you realize that it's not going to make you happy anymore. It's going to destroy your life. Now, porn, the science, the research is now showing it is the new drug and many people are addicted and they have difficulties getting out. The other thing about the porn is that it is a whole industry. It is a human trafficking industry. It is a sexual abuse industry. I was talking to a, a mentee of mine. He reached out to me because he was very promiscuous. I mean, he wasn't married. He, he was into prostitution. He was doing very well. He's a Christian. He was doing very well in the marketplace. He, 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 I, I guess he has issues at home when he was growing up. So he, he was looking for love at all the wrong places. Success in Korea is not enough. He, visit prostitutes wasn't enough he experimented with drugs not enough and went into porn you know he was addicted and god began to convict him because he came to the end of his his uh, his life you know he was just feeling that no, life should not be like that and he decided to take a trip i can't remember whether cambodia or vietnam when he was there he thought he's going to have a silent retreat but he encountered the whole human trafficking industry and he saw women, young girls being sold off into the porn industry. And God used that to convict his heart and he fully repented and now he is telling people, don't touch porn because when there's a demand, there will be a supply and the supply will be from all these uh, families and it's going to destroy many lives. So what do we do? You know, we are all not perfect. We, we can help each other. So if we are struggling at home, whether your marriage or uh, or you have uh, uh, addicted to porn, I would say talk to someone. Talk to your leader, talk to another uh, uh, a father, or, or, or uh, if you are a woman, then talk to another lady and come together. You know, there are applications uh, in technology, there are apps uh, called Covenant Eyes, for example, where we covenant together. You know, if I ever enter into some of these apps, you will get to know, and then you can hold me accountable. Now I want to read from Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31 to 33. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Now, 
this is so beautiful, the two becoming one flesh. You know, that's why it is one flesh, you know. It's not just holding hands and you say, oh, let go your hand now, you know. It is one flesh. One flesh, how can you tear apart? One flesh tearing apart is like pulling off the arm or pulling off the leg. That's why when husband and wife have conflict, especially when they end off in divorce, there is a lot of brokenness, a lot of pain. I want to focus on verse 32. This is the profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. No, marriage relationship reflect Christ as the bridegroom and the church as the bride. It's, it's that beautiful union of coming together. How we do marriage will reflect Christ and the church. You know, the most beautiful marriage vow that I've ever witnessed wasn't a young couple in the church uh, setting, beautiful, uh, uh, saying the marriage vow for the first time. You know, the most mar beautiful marriage vow that I actually witnessed was by a couple ce celebrating their golden anniversary. Golden means 50th, 50th anniversary of their marriage. And they were in a hotel setting in a ballroom with about 30, 40 tables. My wife and I were, were just watching. This couple went up, I mean, they are in their 70s, 80 years old. They went up on stage and they said, we would like to say the marriage vow to each other, to renew our marriage vow. You know, when they say, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health. When they say that, there were many were just tearing. They were just, just the eyes went then wet because I too, you know why? Because the wife was wearing a wig. She was undergoing chemotherapy for her cancer. She was wearing a wig. And we know this couple have gone through a lot together, but yet they still hung on. And when they say the marriage vow, for better or for worse, in sickness or in health. You know, that is marriage. That is uh, the profound mystery of husband and wife, of God and the church. I encourage you, you know, if you think that you are struggling with your family relationship, especially your marriage, seek help. You know, your church, Hope Church, I know you have a family life ministry, you have marriage mentors, so I encourage you, start early. Don't even wait until when problem surfaces. Now, I'm going to give an advice to you. This advice was given by God to the first couple in the Garden of Eden, which is Adam and Eve. God said to Adam and Eve, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Basically, don't go there. You know, let me explain. The tree of good and evil, good versus evil, right versus wrong, good versus bad, you know, that is the problem. You know, whenever husband and wife quarrel, whenever we quarrel with our parents or with our children, it's always who is right, who is wrong. Oh, Titi, Didi, Didi is wrong, I'm right. And then husband and wife quarrel, no, he's the bad guy, I'm the good guy. You know, I was counselling this young man, he reached out to me. This was last year, beginning of last year, he reached out to me through my Facebook page, he doesn't know me, I don't know him. He said, Jason, can I see you? I said, sure. He said, I con committed adultery. Uh, I, I shouldn't have done it, I regretted it. I thought my wife's going to leave me, but she didn't, she forgave me. I said, that's wonderful. And then she said, they're, they're going to counselling together. I said, that's wonderful. So at the time, he was the bad guy because he committed adultery. The wife was the good guy. He did wrong. The wife was right in forgiving him. Beautiful, right? Two months later, he met me for a second time. I asked, how are you doing? He said, ayo, terrible, terrible. I said, what happened? Ayah, my wife lah. You know, I want to move on, but she wants to keep talking about it. She cannot move on. I just want to move on. Wow, when I heard that, I realized, oh, he became the good guy. He wanted to forget about it. He wants to move on. The wife became the bad guy. He was doing the right thing, wanting to move on. The wife was doing the wrong thing. You see, when husband and wife quarrel, when family, families quarrel, it's like that. Who is right? Who is wrong? God actually told Adam and Eve, and I'm going to share this with you, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't get stuck there. You know, God said, come to the tree of life, the cross where love is unconditional, where there's forgiveness, there's redemption, there's healing, there's restoration. You know, at the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. It is finished means the price is paid. Everything is done. I remember the prodigal son story. You know the prodigal son story? There's a younger brother right, and an older brother. The younger brother became delinquent. He did the wrong thing, so he left. But when he came home, did the father get stuck here? The younger brother was actually quite prepared to be punished. I am not worthy to be a son. Make me a slave. He was ready to be punished for the rest of his life, to be a slave, to be a servant in the house. But the father didn't get stuck here. He said, yeah, you're wrong. You are the bad guy, you know. The father brought the younger brother from here to here straight away. The father forgave him, embraced him. He said, you're my son. Let's celebrate. Of course, guess what? The older brother was still stuck here. The older brother was saying, 
Dad, how can you just forgive him like that? He should be punished. The brother, the older brother was basically saying, he's wrong, he's bad. But the father was trying to bring both of them here. Now, when I was reading this passage, the prodigal son's story, I was also asking God, God, this younger son actually did something wrong. How come he's not punished? I mean, when we do bad things, there must be consequences. There must be punishment. The price must be paid. And that was when the Lord showed me. You know, when the younger brother came home, the father was so happy. The father told the servants, get the fattened calf and kill it. There was a sacrifice. The price was paid. There was an animal sacrifice. You know, on the cross, Jesus has already sacrificed for our sins, for our shortcomings. If I have offended someone, I can come to the cross for forgiveness and I will receive forgiveness. If someone has offended me, if someone has hurt me, I feel the pain, I can come to the cross and there is healing, there is restoration. The offender and the offended both can come to the cross and Jesus says, it is finished, it is complete. I've talked about downstream parent-child relationship, midstream husband and wife relationship. Let me end with the most important relationship, the God-man relationship, my relationship with God. You know, in the beginning, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. You know, we are all created in God's image. My wife is created in God's image. My children, my parents are created in God's image. You know, as a parent, I'm not sure about you, but once in a while, people will come to me when my children are younger and say, Hey, Jason, your son looks like you, no? Wow. Right? Your, ch- your people come and say, Hey, your child looks like you, or look like mom, look like dad. Because our children are in our image. And yet, God said, we are created in His image. Means we are His children. We are supposed to reflect Him. We are supposed to look like Him. You know, Jesus is the Son of the Father. And Jesus looked exactly like the Father. You know, in John 10, 30, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. And then, of course, Jesus was asked, you know, we have not seen the Father. Show us the Father. And Jesus answered, in John 14, 9, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Now, what if, what if, what if we reflect Jesus, we reflect God, we reflect the Father to our family members? So each time I come home from work, I step into the house, my children look at daddy and say, wow, God comes home. Or I come home to my wife, my wife says, wow, it's like Jesus walking into the house. Or when my wife comes home, it's like, can you imagine if all of us have a strong God-man relationship? We will reflect God. And when we come together, we will be God to each other. It's like God in human skin. Wouldn't that be beautiful? So, of the three relationships, I pray. I pray that you will have a reset for your relationship with God, which is key, the vertical relationship. And out of that, you know, we overflow and then we reset our relationship with our spouse, with each other. And let this be a new beginning for our marriage, our family, our church and our nation. You know, one way to reset any relationship is not to say, oh, forget about it, you know, don't think about the past, let's move on. You know, the best way to reset a relationship is basically to go to the person and say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, will you forgive me? You know, I'm glad that some of the fathers, some of the men that I've been counselling, or even my mentees, younger men, after hearing some of the things that I shared with them, the first thing they did is they will go home, they will say, I'm sorry. I want to start all over. Will you forgive me? That would be the best way to reset. And of course, for us, first thing, we need to go to God and say, God, I'm sorry. I'm supposed to be head of the family. I'm supposed to be the role model. But I've not been doing well. Will you forgive me? Will you help me? So that I can do better. I'm going to pray for you. You know, if every household, wherever you are in Singapore, whether in the North, East, South or West, if every marriage it has a reset. If every parent-child relationship has a reset, you know what's going to happen? That means every marriage is strengthened, every family is strengthened, and in some weeks' time, some months' time, when you all come back to the church, the church will be strong because every family is strong. Because the family is the foundation of the nation, the family is the foundation of the church. And when all the families who have been strengthened come back to the church, the church is strong, the church will be a blessing to the nations. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I just pray in the name of Jesus that you will walk into every household right now. It is not just a physical uh, room, but it is a home. Lord, I pray that every household will have you as the Lord of the family. 
I know that some, fa- some, some families, even Christian families, put you outside the house. Whenever they come home from church, they put you outside the house. But I pray today they will invite you into their homes. That you will be the Lord of the marriage, you will be the Lord of, of, of the husband, of the wife, of, of the man, of the woman, and you will be the Lord of families. And I pray that you will restore, you will bring healing. Every relationship, every relationship will be strengthened. We thank you. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.